let us welcome the Prime Minister to begin the debate. Here, here. Awesome, thank you very much. Um, just to reiterate, my POI preferences are in the chat, please. And yes, thank you, I can see you put that there. All right, starting my speech, assuming that I'm audible in three, two, one. When Fidel Castro nationalized the Cuban sugar industry, it decimated that industry for decades to come. It crippled the Cuban economy. We would never stand for depriving nations of their development. We would always privatize. Two questions in setup. The first is what do we support? We support selling these state-owned enterprises to private companies on an open market to the highest bidder for those companies. Additionally, we were happy to break up those companies and sell parts of them to different private companies, depending on the way that auction process went. The second question in setup then, what do these state-owned enterprises tend to look like? We think they tend to operate on a national scale, which means the government resources tend to be spread relatively thin across that nation. They obviously operate on a large market because of this national scale. They often look like companies such as utilities or such as natural resources that operate on that large scale. The last note is that they are not for profit because they are run by governments. Note that that is not necessarily by choice as we think the governments, even if they wanted to, couldn't necessarily make a profit out of these companies if they were trying because of the way that they are run. But nevertheless, they are usually not run for the purpose of generating profit. The first point of substantive I will bring you is why we boost public services in this move to privatise. It's important to note that when we sell these state-owned enterprises, we think those sales would be lucrative. There's several reasons for this. The first is that there is a guaranteed market for this um, particular company because that company exists already. That meant there was a certainty for whatever the buyer was, they would make profit. Secondly, there was established infrastructure that allowed this company to operate already. The mines were already built for that extraction company. The pipes were already in the ground for that utility company. Thirdly, they had a very low barrier to entry in this market because it only required them to buy the company that was now for sale. That was a relatively easy decision, particularly with all these factors in place. Fourthly, we think that private companies could easily see that there was a large amount of room for improvement of these companies when they were run by governments, when they had to deal with a series of government bureaucracies and challenges that came along with that. We think it also meant that they probably had the ability, for example, to export minerals to foreign countries where governments wouldn't, and the ability to maximize efficiency in that situation of government bureaucracy. We think that meant there was a competitive market for these companies. That meant there were high bids. We were always going to make a lot of money for the government out of this sale. When the government was receiving millions, if not billions of dollars for these companies to be bought by other private corporations, as well as not spending any more money on the upkeep, maintenance and administration of this state-owned enterprise as they do in the status quo, they were going to have a large amount of money that they could then repurpose. What do we think the government then was likely to do with that money? We think they were likely to direct that to the remaining provisions that they were doing as a government. In our best case scenario, we think that looked like public services because they no longer have these state-owned enterprises to divert that money to, because there's public pressure that is likely to continue spending money that is currently being allocated on public services on more public services. And also purely because the electoral incentives of the fact that it looks good when they can say that they are spending money on services that people can benefit from and that people can use. You could not underestimate the impact of this within the debate because this meant that there was more money going to services like health like education, like social safety nets that meant the people within these developing nations would live ultimately better, safer and healthier lives. That was enormously important and something we could only achieve when we privatised these industries. Even if it was just other government spending and investment that they did with this money, that still looked like building infrastructure, that still looked like increasing the overall spending in this economy that meant that people were going to be employed, that meant that people were going to have access to better goods and services and their economies was going to grow. Note how this also rippled into the long term because the ongoing expense of upkeeping this state-owned enterprise was now gone. The massive costs of running an enormous company that had to reach an entire nation was gone, that the company itself could never have been profit seeking which always meant it was a loss for that government. That was a huge expense for their budget that they no longer had to account for. They were also probably able to collect tax from these corporations, which only increased the inflows into government revenue. That was a massive benefit for public services and government investment that was ongoing throughout the long term. Before I move on to my second substantive about how privatisation meant improvement for these businesses, I'll take that POI. Using services such as healthcare and education would also be highly lucrative and you could use that money for greater government spending. Would you privatize healthcare and education? 
We think that there are certain industries that the government deliberately does not privatise because privatising them would mean an instance of market failure where the government didn't see an efficient allocation of resources in society. We think that that obviously exists for something like health where the government is not willing to let their people die on the streets because they have no access to medical care. That is not at all analogous to the government selling a market mining company. Obviously, no one is starving as a result of that. In fact, they benefit from the economic proceeds of that. That was clearly a line that we were able to draw in what companies we were willing to sell and what companies we were not. So why would privatization of these businesses mean improvement for these enterprises and the flow on effects that would have for these nations? It's important to note that now that this is no longer a state-owned enterprise, this industry can have competition. Firstly, because that competition is now legal in a way that most governments do not legally allow co private competition to their state-owned enterprise. Secondly, that now private companies feel that they can enter that market because it's far easier to compete with a private company than a state-owned one, but also because when there is a private company already there, it proves that this market is actually profitable. It proves that you don't need to make a loss. Thirdly, we were able to sell this to multiple companies, which instantly set up a situation in which there was competition between those two or more companies. Fourthly, because companies exist in the status quo that have an ability to expand their resources or reallocate them to move into this market. For example, if they already own mines and they extract one kind of mineral, they can now extract even more. If there is one utility that they provide, they can use the resources they already have to transport things across long distances to mean that they can now enter this industry. Because there was a chance and an ability for there to be competition, we think it guaranteed the likelihood that there would be. Because companies want to make profit. Because there will now exist like less profitable companies that will want to break into this new market as a chance to improve their business operations. Because there are probably already companies that are in this market and now want to stay because of the sunk costs they put into this market. Because there's probably a high barrier of exiting at the point where they need to admit they have a loss and go completely bankrupt to exit. So when we had this competition, because companies were incentivized to and because they had the ability to, how do we get better efficiency? We got better efficiency because when there was competition, companies were forced to lower their prices in order to make profit. First of all, that meant they had to lower their prices from the get-go to make sure that they got customers buying their products. That was better for everyone who was now able to buy products at a cheaper price. That was good for family budgets. That was incredibly important for all consumers. They also likely had to innovate to make their products cheaper. That meant that they were being more productive. That meant they were increasing their development. They also likely had to find ways of making their products better quality so that it would be more marketable in a situation where they weren't simply able to lower their costs from the, from the outset. And overall, they had to become much more productive to make their cost per unit of production a lot lower. Also note that we think there are some reasons why private companies are intrinsically likely to be more efficient than a government. Notice that a company, because it must make a profit in order to keep operating, does not, cannot have the same level of bureaucracy and administration as a government, cannot have the level of corruption that a government can have because they cannot operate at a loss. They also aren't subject to government volatility when elections change, when the government budget is manipulated. That meant that they were able to run this company so much more efficiently and so much better. They were motivated to and they were able to because they had expertise that politicians and government officials would never have because they had industry experience that simply wasn't there in the government. The impacts of this were enormous for the consumers that did not have to pay a larger price for the goods and services they needed in their everyday life because of the innovation that meant that these nations were finally able to access some form of development that their government could never foresee or never sponsor because of the productivity that meant they could compete globally and gain foreign investment. We were the only side in this debate that allowed these developing countries to become developed, we propose. Thank you, Speaker Sir, for eight minutes and 11 seconds. Thank you, Speaker, for that fine speech. Let us welcome the Leader of Opposition to open up the opposition case today. Here, here. Hi, uh, can I be seen and heard clearly? Yep, you're both visible and audible. Oh, sorry, this laptop was muted. Uh, one more time, can I be seen and heard clearly? Yep, you're both yep. visible. And visible. Awesome. Um, so just a reminder, they're them pronouns, who are in chat. Proper, have you believed that these are just trivial industries that states have nationalized for their own personal gain. This is not true. In developing countries with extremely high levels of poverty, people are extremely, extremely dependent on state-owned enterprises for their livelihood. 
access to things like electricity, water, public transport, not only for the use of these services, but also employment within these services. In the developing the world, the state is the largest employer of people. In India, over half a billion people are employed within the state sector. That is the problem with proposition, a failure to understand what state-owned enterprises really mean to people. In terms of context, I want to make it clear that the creation of state-owned enterprises came about as a reaction to the fact that no market existed at all or was very, very small within these countries. For example, the creation of the Indian Railway was spearheaded by governments because of the fact that there was no private company to do so, as well as the fact that many businesses in these countries are reliant on state-owned enterprises, things like electricity, water, and transport. Just I want to clarify the huge degree of dependence. Our counterfactual is thus where state-owned enterprises remain within the view of the state and the government charges for these services and operates them at cost, the state can retain ownership over SOEs. We use the same fiat used on their side to engage in reforms, to instead do things like create incentives to increase efficiency by giving higher salaries for workers in the instance when they are more productive, bonuses to budgets on the basis of higher efficiency. So if the electricity board is more efficient this year than last year, we give it more of the government budget. Before I move to argumentation, very quickly point of rebuttal as to their context, with the rest of my uh, rebuttal integrated into argumentation and flag. I want to make it clear that it is very, very unlikely they'll be able to do things like sell in parts on their side of the house. This is just because the infrastructure necessary for this is so large that you can't have multiple owners. For example, water pipelines that stretch across a country, it doesn't make sense for one company to own half the pipeline and another country to own the other half. You have to have one company that owns all of it. So it will always, always be sold to one country. The second thing is that it's not going to be things in the vast majority of cases like mining or natural resources. Cuba, as an example, is pretty unstrategic because it's a communist nation that's one of the vast minority in the world. In most nations, this looks like things like transport and utilities, and in a lot of nations, also airlines. So what we're talking about in you know, on our side of the house, the majority burden in terms of things like transport, utilities, and airlines. Right. Before my argumentation, I'll take a point. If we are able, with private companies, to provide these services at lower prices and use an efficiency that means more employment, how do we not make the lives of people in these countries better? I'm going to prove that that's structurally impossible. First argument as to why you worsen accessibility to utilities on the asset of the house. The context of this argument is that the reason many of these services are SOEs is because there would be natural monopolies under a free market. This is for two big reasons. Firstly, de their demand inelastic because people are dependent on them for their necessities, things like water and electricity. So these companies can raise prices and people have to keep buying at that higher price. The second is the nature of infrastructure, where it is hard to switch between providers because you can't do things like rip out the current cables you have and put in new ones. And there's high barriers to entry because even if they say that there is a low cost of buying it, there's also a very high cost for these companies in terms of operating it, which is why unlike what they say, the, cost, the barriers to entry are not low, they're actually very high. What this then means is that because companies are profit motivated, they do three things. One, they don't care whether people can afford it or not. All they care about is making a profit, which is why, especially in utilities, they can use a business model of few consumers and high prices to make profit, reducing the number of people who can access it, but price gouging to cover their red line. Second thing they'll do is, especially in rural areas, it is unprofitable to go there because the high cost of building infrastructure. And even if we concede infrastructure already exists, because there's a very low population, they can't cover the cost of maintaining the infrastructure. So they would make losses. So there's just no incentive to provide to rural areas at all. The third thing they'll do is cut costs, which means they're very likely to unemploy people. In the Sri Lankan Electricity Board, more than 10% of the country's population is employed within it. This is a large degree of people that are going to be unemployed on their side of the house, which is to a higher degree of welfare spending for the state. This is where we counteract their argumentation in terms of the state earning money. Because maybe it is true that the state earns money from the sale on their side of the house, but the cost to the state are now immensely high when they have to cover the welfare costs of all the people that are unemployed. The impact of privatization is thus that fewer people get access to important utilities, price increases, and quality decreases because dependency on these companies by citizens means that they can reduce quality without having any backlash. If their side wants to now compensate this by doing things like subsidizing, that's a massive cost to the state for no benefit because these companies just, just continue raising the prices with no backlash, and thus you don't solve the same issue that they're trying to claim on their side of the house. Here's why it's better as an SOE. The state has an electoral incentive to make sure that these things are accessible because they will likely get voted out if they do not do so. Even in rural areas, these are more likely to have resources on our side of the house because these are swing districts. More 
like you to swing between one political party to the other, such as rural areas in India, for example, Kerala. That is why you are extremely likely to continue provision on our side of the house. Second, there is a government incentive to maintain industries like agriculture, which are the largest industries in these countries that don't have any private companies don't have an incentive to do that. So they won't go to rural areas. Three, governments can run these industries at a loss, which is a good thing because you can provide people with necessary things like water and electricity, even during economic slumps. This may be temporarily higher costs, but it's better in the long term because we can get people out of recessions faster as a result of people, less people being unemployed. The conclusion of this argument is that privatization leads to worse outcomes for the most vulnerable. Here's where I'm going to do some way up and directly deal with their argumentation. That POI concedes that privatizing healthcare is bad because of market failure. We've just proven that there will be an equal degree of market failure in the instance where you privatize these industries. So by principle, they can see that we should not do so. As a result, we've proven that their argumentation is flipped and we've proven that all of that doesn't matter. The second thing in terms of response I'm going to deal with now is their argumentation on competition. We've now proven to you that for structural reasons, there will likely be a natural monopoly created. My second argument is going to like now prove why corruption gets worse and this creates a private monopoly more so on their side of the house. But before that, I want to deal with the argumentation on how low competition leads to lower prices. This is not true because consumers cannot switch between companies. You cannot rip out your electricity cables every time your company prices you up and switch to another electricity provider. So even if there is competition in the market overall, there will certainly be regional monopolies where one company can control city A and another company can control city B. Right. Second argument on why corruption gets worse. The context of this argument is that there's likely to be less scrutiny over privatization because the process is largely opaque because company bidding is private and the people who are likely to most be affected are the least informed, i.e. the poor who have very little access to information. The process of privatization is thus likely to be corrupt because politicians have an incentive to give these companies over to their cronies as a result of them being able to get money by sitting on the boards of these new companies. Thus, they're likely to not give this over to the best company, but rather to the government lackeys or the company who pays most and they can continue making money and be designing funds with much fewer checks because you can't trace ownership back to the government. Even for non-corrupt states, this is still terrible because it is these companies who now have control over utilities, but the state still depends on utilities for education and healthcare. As a result, you create corporate leverage over states. An example here would be Venezuela, where they privatize water and then water companies force governments to cut things like worker rights and environmental rights to allow them to pollute because the government had no alternative because they are now dependent on this company. On our side of the house, we get less corruption because SOEs feel the effect of, because people feel the effect of losses of SOEs and thus are less likely to want to have that taken out of their tax and governments on their side of the house point to the free market as an excuse for lax regulations. It is on their side of the house that they worsen corruption and damn the lives of the poorest in these countries. Unjust opposed. Thank you, Speaker, for that fine speech. Speaker, so for eight minutes and 22 seconds, let us welcome the Deputy Prime Minister to continue the proposition case. Here, here. Just checking that I'm audible. Um, you're slightly faint. I'm not sure if it's because of a volume thing, but can you like, try can speaking? You yep, slightly clear, yeah. Perfect. Uh, starting my speech in three, two, one. I'm gonna do two clear things in this speech. Firstly, I'm gonna prove why we make these industries more accessible to the most vulnerable individuals. And secondly, I'm going to prove why we make governments better dealing with all of their material about uh, corruption and things like that. On the first question, then, which side makes these things more accessible? They make one big claim here, which is to say it creates monopolies. And when you create monopolies, you're able to dictate things like the price because no individual is willing to like disengage because you can just set the price to be whatever you want. This misunderstands how open markets work, which is to say, when a government has complete control, there is no incentive for other corporations to move into that industry, to move into that area. 
But what our side does is actively open it up. That is to say, even if you don't win the specific contract for this industry, now you perceive yourself to be a greater competitor because you don't think the government is able to, to like outregulate you, out manipulate you, just like model you out from your ability to exist. Which is to say that under our side, we get open markets and we get competition for all of the reasons we give you at live about how now countries perceive, rather corporations perceive the ability to get better, better, better change. They say that regional uh, monopolies are different because consumers can't switch. Yes, you can, right? Like this misunderstands how things like electricity works, which is to say it doesn't necessitate a huge amount of infrastructure that these individuals cannot possibly switch behind. You're able to do things like, like just make choices like that. But secondly, note how they try to criticize us for only talking about one specific example, obviously things like airlines are like vulnerable to regional monopolies. If you access things like uh, international corporations who now see that they can succeed, that is very, very different. Secondly, then on rural areas, it is crucial here to note that rural areas not getting services is terrible, but it is probably symmetrical. That is because governments have a resource cap. They can only do so much, which means when they judge whether or not they're going to put resources into specific areas, they make the decision under the status quo not to put resources there. That is that they re recognize that the benefit for that many individuals, because the electoral incentive in regional areas is quite small because the voting population is small, they don't have the incentive to go in and actively make their lives better because the, the amount of infrastructure it would take is what, much greater than what the benefit is in terms of electoral incentive. But even if they do, it's important to weigh this up. That is to say, you need to note that the ability of governments to go into these areas and make good infrastructure is incredibly small because of the capital restrictions that they have. So under our side, when we're able to free up huge amounts of money because we're selling these corporations, we're getting great, greater tax and things like that, these governments are able to do things like prioritize education and healthcare. Note why they have the incentive to do these things. That is because unlike services like electricity or whatever, you're able to mobilize different rural communities around specific things like hospitals, around education centers in a way that you can't with electricity, in a way you certainly can't with things like airlines, which is why they have the incentive and are more able to do that under our side. But so Second, you know, even if you didn't buy that, they're just more able to, right? Because the amount of capital you need to open a school and send a teacher there is incredibly different to building an entire pipeline. They just are more able and are able to change the decision-making calculus in terms of like how much difference they can make by sending in resources. Then they tell you that they are able to cut corners to maximize profits. That means they cut employment and reduce production. This is structurally untrue for the simple reason that obviously these corporations want to be profitable and want to be successful. And if they recognize that the way to do that is to keep, like, keep employees, obviously you're going to keep them. But even if some corporations fight as some people, you still need to reconcile with the fact that other corporations now come in and presumably also need employees, which means just like on math net benefit, obviously our side is better because we get more corporations coming in and of itself, more employees in that way. But even if it is true that we cut some employment, note that this benefit is incredibly marginal, marginal because the extent to which you're likely to fire people is small. So we're probably happy to trade this off at the point at which we can improve public infrastructure surrounding things like unemployment and other social services like that. Finally, on this issue in terms of the idea of agriculture, the governments don't engage with agricultural spheres in and of itself. Like that is just not something they do under the status quo. I'm not sure where they're going with that. I'm not sure how much ground they gain there. What do we tell you under this issue? We tell you we make these industries more efficient because they have specialization. That means they're able to be more successful. When you can be more efficient, you're able to reduce prices to remain competitive. That means that every single good consumers are now able to access at a better price. That's crucial when you look at developing countries where many people are struggling with things like poverty. Now we actively make these things more accessible to them. Thirdly, we tell you about things like FDI, when the fact that other individual uh, corporations from around the world see the capacity for huge benefit in these places through investment, you're more likely to get foreign involvement and the huge benefits that come from that in terms of globalization and industry and the benefits which are subsequent from that. Second issue then, on corruption and government operation. They tell you that governments will embezzle money through this policy and will give it, they give these corporations uh, power and only give it to their friends and terrible actors and things like that. This is that tension with characterization of the government wanting to do good, which is to say that if you buy that they are likely to embezzle, you must also believe that to the extent to which they're going to do good when they own this industry is also incredibly small. Because obviously, if you're willing to do things like deny the public uh, money and just make deals that benefit you, you're also probably likely to minimize costs in terms of going to these rural areas. You're probably willing to minimize time and effort put in to benefits for the major population. In terms of just like manipulating governments, it is unclear why like a regional government is unable to say to a water corporation, which is just like 
entire profits relies on being able to operate, that they're going to be able to manipulate that government. Obviously, the I'll, I'll take a POI in a second. Obviously, the government is able to say that's ridiculous. We're able to ban that. I'll take a POI if you have one. All your reasons as to why there will be incredible demand for the contract of privatization are reasons as to why the cost of buying this contract is incredibly high. Why then can all companies afford to enter this market? Because they have money, right? Like obviously on our side, we're not assuming that companies start up from nothing. But our claim is that companies which already have infrastructure and already engaged probably in neighboring regions just go in and buy this up. But obviously we can just like do things like branch off different corporate, uh, different industries, which is to say that your only response to lives material in like your context rebuttal about whether or not we can actually split these industries which then you can't, you can't split a pipeline. Obviously that is non-responsive to things like airlines. We can sell planes, we can sell other types of infrastructure. It doesn't necessitate big corporations doing everything, but also we probably think they do. So what do you know at the end of this issue? If their characterization of governments is right and they are going likely to embezzle money, they achieve no benefit in this debate because they're unlikely to do positive things for individuals. What we do is free up huge amounts of government spending money that they can flush through things like education and hospitals, which actively better people's lives. One point of substantive then, why we limit instability within industries. That is, the governments, specifically in the developing world, are often subject to extreme volatility, whether it be because of burdens on resources, the effects of geopolitical events, or just the unstable nature of their industries. This is harmful because it means that these industries and the jobs associated with them are at the whim of incredibly volatile forces. Why is it better under our side? Because companies have more focused budgets and permanent mandates with a maintained sense of control. What are the benefits of this? It means that industries become far more stable because the corporations which operate them are more stable able in and of themselves. Why is this incredibly important? Firstly, because you get stability in prices. This is a huge benefit to consumers who now no longer have to worry about how much gas prices are going to change because of how much the, a specific government policy is impacting the government's ability to free up funding. But secondly, it means you get stability in employment. You no, need, no longer need to worry about whether or not you're going to have a job in two years' time because of a specific policy that China's had that impacts your government's ability to have the money to employ you. But thirdly, you just get greater stability in the economy. That is a benefit in and of themselves in these nations, where often economies are incredibly volatile and people have very little trust. That worsens their quality of life. What do you know then at the end of this speech? We free up government mon money that they can put into other services which actively better people's lives, but also we make other industries more efficient and we make other in industries better. So incredibly proud to propose. Thank you, Speaker Sook, for eight minutes and 17 seconds. Let us welcome the Deputy Leader of Opposition to continue the opposition case today. Here, here. Hi, can everyone? Sorry, uh, can everyone hear me now? Yep, you're both visible and audible. Thank you. Uh, I'd like POIs in chat, please. I think it's important in this debate to realize what privatization really means. Because a lot of propositions analysis is most applicable if this were a this house prefers motion about whether from the beginning of time we would have preferred had certain industries been controlled by the private sector or whether they had been state owned. But unfortunately, that's not the debate that we're having. 
even their own examples of doing things like nationalizing minerals and the oil industry are about creating new state monopolies in industries where there is already a thriving private market. Clearly, states already don't do that, given that there is a limitation to the number of state-owned enterprises that exists even in countries like Sri Lanka, and given that states also don't have an incentive to do things like ban private competition. This debate is about taking existing state-owned enterprises and pushing them into the private market through auctions. The importance of this is twofold. Firstly, these are industries that people have already begun to depend on. Many people in countries like India and Sri Lanka already depend on state-owned enterprises for employment, and many people rely on subsidized services to be able to afford them. But secondly, the same issues of corruption, nepotism, and bureaucracy that they pointed out to you are likely to bleed into the process of privatizing these industries, given that you are taking an existing state-owned enterprise, which they presume is corrupt, and attempting to push it into private market. We think that the incentives of politicians to want to leverage this to their benefit will exist as well. This is important because it proves that even if state-owned enterprises are not perfect, even if in certain instances they are somewhat corrupt and loss-making, we ought to maintain them because the costs of trying to privatize them in a world where people are already dependent on them are far too high. This takes me to my first area of response about which side has better public services. I want to respond to the framing of this argument that proposition gives us because they say that the sale will be lucrative because there's a guaranteed market and infrastructure and you can maximize opportunities because you open up competition. I would counter frame that there is massive uncertainty associated with the profitability of these industries for two reasons. Firstly, most state-owned enterprises are fundamentally loss-making because people in developing countries have limited purchasing power, which means the state often has to intervene through subsidies to make sure that these services are affordable. So the vast majority of private companies would see this as an indicator that if they were to enter the industry, they too would make losses. But secondly, the only reason that some state-owned enterprises are profitable is because there isn't massive competition, given that the state has control over this through state monopolies. And so we think that private companies would deduce that even if these industries are profitable now, once a private market is created and competition exists, it would no longer be profitable given the ground realities within developing countries. This framing is important because it means that the idealistic version of propositions model, where you'll be able to partition off different parts of industries and sell each part to a different private company is unlikely. The only conditions under which private companies are likely to want to participate in auctions to buy state-owned enterprises is if they can control the whole supply chain, because that is the only way in which they can guarantee that they are profitable, given that regional markets are also likely to fail in instances where the regional market that you own and buy is one that is rural and therefore less profitable. And so private companies would also want national control over these industries as opposed to being limited to a specific region. This proves that the most efficient companies are unlikely to be the ones who participate in these auctions. And even if they do, they're likely to place massive restrictions on the way in which the government can sell to them, even if the government isn't corrupt. This leads me to the second claim that they make, that the money will be used for greater government spending. The first thing that I would point out is that the profitability of these industries will require changes to the way in which state-owned enterprises operate. For example, reducing redundancies by cutting down on the bureaucracy that they wanted to talk about, which is really just pushing a lot of people into unemployment. The point is the money that they earn from the auction will be used to in, will necessarily increase costs to the government because when people lose their jobs you have to pay for things like welfare and unemployment benefits so the amount of money that they have after they have accounted for the loss is probably far far lower given that the effects of things like unemployment compound over time the third thing that they say is that this creates competition the first thing that i would point out is that a lot of the benefits of having higher quality services aren't really very important with basic utilities. Like I don't care about having like a very high quality electricity supply, but given that these are basic utilities in nature, any electrical supply is probably more important, which is why we think accessibility has to be weighed over the quality of these services. I would point out then that private companies will find it prof profitable in certain instances to pursue alternative business models as opposed to giving everyone equal access to these services. What do these alternative business models look like? Firstly, in areas with low population density, they are unlikely to enter the market, given that operating costs will be too high and existing infrastructure is limited. So they're concentrated in urban areas areas. They say that this is symmetric. I refuse to believe that no government has an incentive to give poor people in rural areas who are more likely to vote and turn out access to public services. To say that these people don't have access to basic utilities is simply untrue. But the second thing that I would point out is that on their side of the house, you can't guarantee that private companies will continue to provide the same supply of these services to the domestic market. So for example, when they say you can just become more profitable by exporting, we think that that's a really bad thing because if 
existing state-owned enterprises pivot towards an export-oriented model. It means the services and access to essential goods like gas, for example, is likely to be driven out of domestic markets and into foreign markets. Finally, our, their responses to our arguments. They say that they can open up industries and that this can prevent the creation of natural monopolies. But this is unresponsive to the claim that we made, which is that what makes things like water and electricity natural monopolies isn't the fact that there is a state monopoly currently, it's the very nature of this service itself. It's very difficult to tear out existing water pipelines from your home, given that that probably leads to a main water supply that goes to your region, which in turn leads to a water distributor. And so we think that infrastructure is often fixed, which means that people can't switch in between services. And that makes that process very, very difficult. Before I move on, I'll take the point. Only one of your two claims can be true. Either everyone or a large portion of people in these countries rely on these industries because everyone consumes this product because they are a huge employer, or these industries are not profitable enough for companies who want to enter into this market. Which one of these claims is true? Just because currently the government gives people a lot of access to this service doesn't mean that it would be profitable given that the government is also subsidizing it. They make a few glib responses in a second. Firstly, they say that governments have a resource cap. Governments don't really have massive capital restrictions given that they can raise money through the sale of government bonds or higher taxation. And secondly, I would point out there are incentives to give services to rural areas regardless. They are often swing voters. They're necessary to form coalition governments. Regional governments are likely to lobby the federal government in order to do so. Finally, they say that corporations won't be profitable and therefore they won't fire people. This is untrue. If what they say is true at the top and there is existing bureaucracy, then firing people will be necessary. How is this supposed to be made? Even if on our side of the house, we need to maintain national carriers that are highly loss-making industries. We can always do that by increasing taxes on the growing middle class and large businesses in these countries, which is what most developing countries already do. However, on their side of the house, it is the poorest people who have the least access to these services. Finally, on reducing the effects of corruption. I want to point out that there is very little response to the analysis that we gave you, which is that even though broadly governments are responsive to electoral incentives, some elements within the government are corrupt. There are a number of reasons why corruption is better dealt with on our side of the house. Firstly, it is far easier to have scrutiny on state-owned enterprises as opposed to private businesses that are owned by state cronies, given that you need to discover the fact that they have ties to the state in the first place. But secondly, the state can always default to the fact that these are private businesses, and so they shouldn't be forced to give up their expense reports to the public, and we shouldn't have immense regulations on them because the point of privatization was to facilitate a private market. And so there are ways in which the state can better facilitate corruption on their side of the house. Importantly, if the process of privatization puts state-owned enterprises into the hands of state cronies, where electoral incentives are no longer likely to lead to greater accountability, it means the effects of corruption are great on their side. For all of these reasons, oppose. Thank you, Speaker Sook, for eight minutes and 14 seconds. Thank you, Speaker, for that fine speech. Let us welcome the government whip to conclude the government's constructive case today. Here, here. Oh, oh, it's fine. Oh, oh, oh. Guys, um, am I audible? Um, you're audible, but not visible. Oh, you're not audible and visible. Cool. The problem with this opposition case is that as much as they want to say companies are bad, they provide almost no material why governments are likely to run them better other than the words electoral centers. I'm going to break that down in my speech. And if governments have no reason to run it better, then this opposition 
Opposition is actually the one that harms the poorest people the most. They are the ones that force people to pay higher prices for electricity because there is no innovation in that industry. Because there are no reasons why those prices get cheaper. And I'm going to explain that in my speech. Their line about cronies as well, I would note, is the exact reason why the government is likely to be corrupt in these instances, why they're so inefficient, why they're so bureaucratic, which means that even in their best case, where we assume that governments have the best incentives, unlikely that they're able to get the cheapest prices, which we are going to support on our side. There are two questions in this speech. The first is how does this affect these services? And secondly, how does this affect the overall economy of these countries? Starting off with the first issue, because it's the most important part of this debate, and it's clearly where we come out in time. This will explain why it's only under our side where the best services come out and where people actually have the incentives to ensure that the prices are the cheapest. There are two things we're going to talk about here. Firstly, let's talk about governments. Secondly, let's talk about companies. Firstly, on governments. The only thing they say about why governments are likely to do this well is electoral incentives. I'm going to give you four reasons why that's unlikely to actually lead to the outcomes they say. The first thing to say is that there is no comparison of service, which makes it hard to complain about how like the, about whether that service is good or bad. And so therefore it means that it's unlikely that people are going to cast their vote on that. But secondly, because electoral incentives are incredibly slow. So even if you buy their mechanism, it takes four years for that to happen. Our market immediately adjusts. Our market is one that immediately makes the choice price cheaper. And that is a claim this opposition cannot get. But thirdly, because other factors exist in elections other than like like how much your airline costs, which is to say that clearly under our side, that is when we get the market mechanism, whereas this opposition can't rely on people to vote explicitly on how much their airline costs. Instead, they probably vote on things like taxes. And this opposition has not explained why this electoral incentive will work. The final thing to say is that it's easy for governments to, to blame external factors. And that's for the reason they can say, well, there was less electricity this year because less was produced. It's incredibly hard for people to use that as a reason to vote them out. All that is to say that the one mechanism this opposition relies on, which is electoral incentives, does not work in this debate, which means that under their side, they have no reason to make those prices cheaper. They have no reason to make sure that electricity prices go down in the same way that companies do. But the second thing to say is that let's take this opposition at their best and assume that governments have all these really good incentives. Note that they don't explain how they can overcome the bureaucratic barriers that we point out from first. The fact that they themselves talk about corruption, the fact that they themselves talk about cronyism, which is more likely to happen under their side, because clearly it's much easier to investigate a company than it is to have the government investigate itself. And that's clearly why we win out on that. And it's worse under this opposition side. The third thing to say is that even if this opposition, even in their best case, ignoring all that makes it cheaper, they haven't explained why governments are likely to manage it better. Because cheaper in their best case is not always good if you're oversupplying something which you have limited resources on. Which is to say that if a government has short-term interest and they push out all the electricity in four years and do not have electricity for the next four years, that is obviously harmful. What we have under our side is a market mechanism that appropriately makes the price correct. It means that people can access it, but it means that people can access it sustainably. And that is what this opposition has not engaged in. So what we know so far is that this opposition does not provide reasons why the government is likely to be good at providing the service. By comparison, we have for companies. So second, let's talk about companies. The first line of attack is that you don't service rural areas. Two responses. Firstly, it is still profitable because the infrastructure already exists. The reason why it may not be profitable before is because you have to build up that infrastructure. But to the extent it already exists, it is still like profit in order to service that place because you can still make money from it, even if it's less so than you might originally. But the second thing to say is that this is uncomparative because it's unclear why governments with electoral and short-term incentives would be providing those rural, those rural places or other places with the services which they want to defend under their side. So clearly that's uncomparative and it's likely worse. The second line of attack is to say that they, these places are natural monopolies. There are two responses. The first thing to say is that we think that this is unlikely because there's no reason why you would want to cut out all the people in the market except the super rich. And the reason for that are known is because you want more people to access it such that you can make more profit overall. And note that even if you don't buy that, the other reason why you necessarily want more people to access it is because it grants you stability, which is to say that if you only have like a few thousand people who are flying your planes, you don't know when they're likely to fly those planes. But the bigger your market is, the more stable your profit is because it happens over a greater group of people. So the amount that they consume each time matters less. And that is what grants you stable profit. But secondly, we do unlikely to have a monopoly because lots of companies want to enter the market. And it's unlikely that they pull out halfway 
because of the fact that they've already invested, which means that instead they're likely to compete, they're likely to improve their service overall. The final thing that we explain is that there is a certainty because they know that the market exists and that necessarily means they'll make profit. The only response here is that they'll only buy it from governments, they don't sell it to others. Firstly, that is not true because we think that governments are the ones who are able to set conditions, given that they're the ones, they're the ones selling the product and they are obviously therefore the ones in power. But secondly, because even if you don't sell it initially to lots of people, other or like obviously other companies can come in, they can build up their own infrastructure, and that is what triggers competition. The final claim here is that you can only have one pipeline for one house. We've already dealt with this at second, but I will note that you can build more, like, like you can build more pipelines to one house. And it's unclear why this applies to a whole set of other companies like Airways, which we talked about from first. But the second thing to note here is that even if it is true, we think there is still competition because if you are not efficient enough, other companies will choose to buy you out. And I'm going to move on to their final piece of substantive, but before that, I'll take a point. Your first speaker says that the reason these institutions operate at cost and aren't profitable is due to mass government subsidies to provide uh, cheaper utilities. You say that these government incentives don't work and these are actually very expensive. Which one of these characterizations is true? What we said from first is that governments don't need to make profit. But that is the exact reason why government that is the exact reason why governments don't innovate into the future. That is the reason why electricity doesn't become cheaper. That is the reason why these services don't improve. And it's on the on the outside where we have competition that makes those services better. What do we tell you here? Because note that they don't respond at all to our second piece of substantive, from our piece of substantive and second, about more stability. Because given that many developing nations are unstable, it is only side, under side proposition where governments where, where the instability of a government does not affect that entire economy. That is to say that if the government is unstable, that can take away resources from people. Whereas if we have multiple companies running around that economy, that necessarily means that you're unlikely to pose that risk and you're unlikely to have that harm. So the final thing I'm going to talk about in this speech is how does this affect the overall economy of these countries? And this is important because it drastically raises this burden. Because even if you believe that their services are slightly better, you have to weigh that up against the billions of dollars we give you on our side. We say that the money spent on the infrastructure can now be spent on governmental programs because tax increases under our side, the amount of money you get from the sale of these companies increases, and they virtually have no response other than to talk about employment. Let's deal with their employment claim here. We would say that we actually win on employment. And the reason why that's true is because when you have more companies operating in that specific industry, it means that they have to compete against one another, which means that they have to outdo each other to sustain themselves. What that means is that under our side, where you're trying to innovate more, you employ more people, you ensure that you are the one who can produce the service at the cheapest rate for the best price. And that is necessarily why we win on employment. Because when there are so many companies operating, that is better than a government which does not allow for that competition. That is better because governments have no reason to improve their own incentives, sorry, to improve their own product to the extent that they know that there will be no cost to them if they don't. At the end of the speech, what do you know? This opposition has not provided reasons why, why governments are likely to actually improve their service. By comparison, we have pointed out a simple market mechanism that allows companies to improve themselves into the long term, which this opposition has not engaged with. So proud of the first. Thank you, Speaker Sok, for eight minutes and seven seconds. Let us welcome the opposition whip for um, to conclude the opposition constructive case. Here, here. Hi, just to check if I'm audible and visible. Yep, they're both audible and visible. Uh, PO is in chat, please. 
three questions in this speech. First on government incentives, second on competition and innovation, finally on accessibility and exploitation. First on government incentives. I want to note that we get a laundry list of reasons in third as to why governments don't have the incentive to provide cheap and accessible state services that are of a good quality. I want to note that we don't need the best quality services on our side of the house, but it needs to meet, meet a minimum level such as clean water. Note that the best response to this argument was already given to you across both of our first two speeches. That is, direct state ownership of these industries and revenue means that any mess up that occurs or any problem that arises from these utilities is directly tied back to the state and it massively hurts the state's chances at re-election. Even corrupt governments want to be re-elected because that is how they can be in power and consolidate that power. And given how much people value things like water, value things like electricity, because it creates employment and because it's affordable, I would note then that the electoral incentive is strong on our side of the house. In third, they tell us, no, you're just going to push out all the electricity in your first four years of your term, and there won't be any electricity left after. Look, I've done A-level physics. Electricity is produced through like turbines and stuff, you can't just push everything out. But more importantly, I want to note that party re-election is also a big thing, that you don't just want to protect the current candidate in power, you want your party to keep getting re-elected in the future. So if you mess up in one term and the next year people are living extremely bad lives, I would note that the blame comes to your party. The thing to note here is that when, they, when this is privatized, the external check and the ability for governments to deflect blame is far greater on proposition side of the house. This is due to three reasons. First, the bidding process in itself is opaque, given that things such as journalistic freedoms aren't the best in the developing world. And given that the poor only feel the effects and harms of privatization after the contract has been bid for, it means the most reliable actors don't necessarily get the contract, but only the highest bidders do in propositions world. But second, it's harder to identify instances of state abuse through private corporations because they can do things like hide black money in shell corporations abroad. The, and finally, I want to note that states can sell the rhetoric to their populations that it isn't necessarily their fault that this company is abusing them, that they're actually meant for lower prices and better quality. So when abuse does occur on proposition side of the house, states can deflect it and don't need to take responsibility for it. So make no mistake, corruption isn't symmetric. It becomes worse on that side. The second thing I want to talk about is competition. Note crucially that all of their benefits, such as lower prices, are contingent on only or contingent on a multiplicity of actors existing within this market, and therefore prices will be lower. What I want to flesh out is why monopolies are likely to exist on their side of the house. The first thing we told you is that the cost of switching to consumers is exorbitantly high. They say it's not really. You can rip all out your water and electricity lines and put new ones in if you want to switch to a new company. Yeah, you can do that. But the fact is, doing that is extremely costly to the middle class or lower income person within the developing world. And that in itself is a reason for as to why they cannot switch. Note crucially, that Chanito gave you analysis in his second speech as to why there will be very few bidders within the market. One, given that it is a state monopoly and these companies and the state is already making a loss on selling at cost, companies think that at the end of the day, these are unprofitable industries to invest into due to the uncertainty that exists. But second, given that the vast majority of consumers in the developing world are poor, companies are uncertain on whether or whether or not they can make a profit within these industries, whether if they charge even marginally higher prices, whether people will buy that product. What is the implication of this analysis? This means that the companies that can afford the contract of privatization are those that can weather those uncertainties and afford those extremely high costs, which are likely to be the few richest MNCs around the world or within these countries, and therefore monopolization is likely. Even at their best, let's say monopolies don't occur, then there are one of two possibilities. First are oligopolies, where there are a few companies operating within the market, and in order to reduce things such as costs across production, they do, do things like collude, so they can use each other's railway lines, they can use each other's electricity and water lines. 
or given that consumers find it hard to switch, even if there are multiple companies within the market, there are regional monopolies where consumers within a certain region or certain area of a country cannot afford to switch. And this leads to exploitation and higher prices. The second mechanism they gave us for as to why innovation leads, uh, is that innovation leads to lower prices. But why are companies incentivized to innovate given that competition isn't the greatest within the market? Like I would counter argue that it is actually beneficial to reduce the quality of these services because that is what is the most profitable and it allows you to cut costs within the industry. Especially if you have to give this to a large amount of people, I'm unsure why you will give the highest quality service. Let's weigh this argument. Even if the price is not exorbitantly high in proposition's world, it is still higher than it is in our world. This is because in our world, governments operate at cost, while on propositions well, companies need to make some profit, if not the most profit, and therefore prices will be higher than they are in the status quo. To the poor person in India who doesn't have the capital to afford his child's education or put three meals on the table, even a marginal increase in prices is banned for that case. The final thing then is on exploitation. The first thing I want to flesh out is that demand for these services may be inelastic. But if many people can't afford it, they are forced not to use these utilities. So proposition can't hide behind demand inelasticity. But the way companies can make a profit is by switching their business model, which is even if we reduce the amount of consumers, we will just charge the existing consumer base higher prices. This is a problem because when people can't afford things such as electricity and water, when they don't have the transport in order to get to work, this increases the cost of living to individuals and it hurts states because states are the ones who have to create the safety net for these people. But second, I want to weigh this analysis because even if we are not talking about industries like electricity and water and we're talking about industries such as mining, think about how mining is important for the exports of a state, how the raw materials that comes from mines are integral to export-oriented nations such as South Korea. So I would note then that this deals with their argument that we can get a lot of money by scaling state industries. Because at the end of the day, if that money has to be used to cover up the cost of exploitation of companies, there is a net harm on proposition. The second thing I want to talk about in this clash is on rural areas. First, in places that is existing infrastructure, the operational cost of companies is too high to uh too high to operate. Given that few people live in these areas, companies find it more profitable to just not provide services to these areas. Given that these are the poorest people, they are the most vulnerable and proposition harms them. Second, areas that have no infrastructure. I want to note that the only response to this was states won't do so either. But we gave you a multitude of analysis as to why states will do so. That is, there's an electoral incentive of swing states. Regional governments, for example, want to create coalitions within parliament in order to lobby the federal government. So I do note that rural areas are far better off on our side of the house. Proposition ultimately needed to prove that prices were so high in the status quo that there is a problem that requires privatization. They haven't done so, oppose. Thank you, Speaker, for that fine speech. Um, let us well, um, Speaker, spoke for eight minutes and 16 seconds. Let us welcome the opposition reply to conclude the opposition case as a whole. Here, here. Cool. Uh, can I just that thing? Yep, you're both audible and visible. Great. <laughs> Two sections in this reply speech. Firstly, I'm going to go over the mechanistic contentions between the two sides. Then I'm going to go to the clashes. Firstly, I think there are two mechanistic contentions in this debate. Firstly, whether or not competition is likely. And secondly, whether or not rural areas will be cared for on our side. So firstly, in terms of whether or not competition is, un is likely, we gave you multiple reasoning as to why this industry is likely to be a natural monopoly. The cost of replacing infrastructure is too high, demand is inelastic. Even if you can break up parts of the supply chain, government won't do this because of uncertainty in the market. In fact, that it's only profitable if you own the whole supply chain. The fact that governments, uh, the fact 
fact that companies are unlikely to want to invest because they already see this as a cross making industry and there are very few companies will invest the fact that there is an extremely high barrier to entry in terms of being able to maintain the infrastructure all of that their only response here was to say oh but companies want to make profit we this ignores all the structural analysis about developing countries that means that these industries are never going to be profitable why it is required that you run them at a loss and that's why it is only the state that is able to take care of them if you want to make these profitable we told you why this is bad in terms of alternative business orientors uh, orientations such as being export oriented which shani told you was bad because of scarcity in the domestic market or taking a few consumers and giving extremely high prices which cuts off access to the vast majority and makes it much harder for the people who do have access all of this is reasoning as to why competition is worse on their side second mechanistic contention is on rural areas i'm going to do more of this in the clash analysis so i just want to do the weighing here which is say even if governments reject some rural areas those rural areas are much more likely to be rejected by profit motivated motivated businesses because they give us no incentive for profit motivated businesses to go to rural areas whereas we give you some incentive to go to rural areas for government so there's four clashes first in terms of government incentives when there's direct ownership the losses are tied to the state the government wants re-election there's electoral strong, strong electoral incentive which means they are likely to want to provide this for low cost second rural areas are not locked out they are swing states often they often rural governments have lobbying power they often have agricultural importance all of which means governments want to provide for them on contrast on the private sector the ability when you privatize it the ability for governments to deflect blame is lower because the bidding process is opaque it's hard to justify state abuse and states sell the rhetoric of the free market all of which means that government in incentives get worse off on their side of the house and we have proven a government incentive to provide this for a very low cost second clash in terms of competition this is important because all of proposition's benefits are contingent on proving uh, competition exists this is not true for the reason we've told you earlier the way in here is that even if there is no monopoly you're likely to have an oligopoly or regional monopoly which makes it a lot much less accessible and you also reduce innovation because you really don't need to care about innovating if you control the whole market the way in of this is that even if the price is not exorbitantly high it is still higher because it's government selling things at cost versus companies having to sell things with a profit which is why competition is unlikely to happen and therefore exploitation we well, not exploitation but companies are likely to happen and therefore prices are likely to be higher less people have access third clash is on exploitation look who has given you the analysis as to why companies would make profit by doing things like increasing prices for example we want to do some weighing here to concede completely that it is possible that these industries are loss making and come at a cost to the government here's where chanidu's weighing is extremely important on our side of the house even if these industries are loss making you cover up that loss by taxing the rich and upper middle class within these countries to cover for that on their side of the house they force the poorest of the poor and the most vulnerable to cover for this by losing access to important things like water that's necessary for their literal survival or electricity which is important for them to live a decent quality of life so even if it is not things like electricity and water we already given you reasons why even things like mining are important because the state needs access to that and they ability to concentrate the benefit for exports the last clash here is the one that got least uh, response but it's extremely important in terms of social harms the fact that cost cutting is likely to lead to increase in un unemployment which leads to an extreme increase in government spending which undermines any benefit you get from selling it and the fact that corporations get leverage over states where they can hold them at gunpoint and force them to impose policies like they did in venezuela for all of these reasons we are the side that benefits developing countries opposed Thank you, Speaker, for that fine speech. Speaker, so for four minutes and twenty-two seconds, let us welcome the government reply to conclude today's debate as a whole. Just checking that I'm audible. Yep, you're audible and visible. Two questions to ask in judging this debate. Firstly, why the side proposition is able to improve these services and industries. And second, why we improve the overall economic and public services of these nations. On the first question, why we improve these services. I'm gonna split this into two parts. Firstly, talking about the behavior of governments, and then secondly, talking about the behavior of these companies. Firstly on governments. It is crucial to note that most of their benefits in this debate rely on governments having good incentives. Why do we think they do not? The only claim here is to say that they have good electoral and strong electoral incentives. We respond to this in four key ways. First, we say that this in and of itself isn't enough because there's no comparison that voters can make 
So it doesn't impact their voting decision because they cannot decide that a government is less or more better at a specific thing than other corporations. But secondly, we say this mechanism is slow and that's common in itself. Thirdly, we say that other factors matter to individuals when they're voting. So this is an insufficient bar to meet in terms of whether or not this is going to impact individuals' ability to make good choices. But fourthly, and crucially, we say governments can just blame other factors so that individuals are less informed when they make this ballot. This is all reasons why they don't do this well. But even if we take side Sri Lanka at their best and say they do, get, do have good incentives, why do we still win this debate? Because governments don't do this as well as corporations. That's firstly because of structural problems like corruption that they observe. The fact that you cannot have investigations into your own government be as successful as you could into other companies means that they lose out on all of those benefits. Second, it's the lack of expertise and skill, which is simply structurally and empirically true. They are less able to innovate because they do not have the same infrastructure. They do not have the same capital. Thirdly, it's the mismanagement of funds and lack of funds. Team Sri Lanka tries to run away with this debate by saying that they don't have capital caps. Obviously, that's a lie when most of their contextualization is pointing out people living in abject poverty. If they didn't have capital, pa capital caps, they could solve their problems. They couldn't. They didn't have the same amount of money that these corporations did, so they were going to be worse at it. But even if they could do this well, it was still worse. Because firstly, they didn't have to come at a cost, so they had no incentive to innovate. This is material we give you a third. That is, they don't have market incentives which force them to continue to get better. So there's no incentive for them to get better. They continue to do the status quo. That is why these services are the worst in governments alone. Secondly, then, let's talk about government behaviors. They try to make, uh, sorry, company behaviors. They try to make one big claim here, which is that people in rural areas lose out. We respond to this in three key ways. Firstly, we reject it. We say that the infrastructure which already exists in these areas means that these companies are likely to just take over and to continue maximizing profit in these areas. Second, we tell you if this infrastructure doesn't already exist, then this is a symmetrical harm because governments are unlikely to continue to go into the most rural areas to provide them with these services. But thirdly, we tell you we would trade it off the huge benefit we could get when we free up government spending to focus on other things. Finally, then, they make a ditch on monopolies and try to say this is the most important thing in this debate. We respond to it in one key way, which is to say that many competition, that this policy enforces competition. They tell you in response that uh, it is the, the companies will simply collude. Note at best for them, this is mitigatory and doesn't deal with the nuance and sophistication that we give you about why companies want to expand, about why they must be profitable given all of their framing about the scale of these industries and why that means we get better quality. The impacts of this are huge. It's the fact that now transport is better, people live easier lives. It's the fact we improve the economic capacity of these countries and we increase employment on their own metrics we win this debate. But even if you didn't buy any of that, our alternate path to victory is just that this improves overall economies and public services. The scale of employment they want to claim in this debate is insufficient. That is because more companies existing means you get more employment. On numbers alone, we win this debate. The second, it's to say that we could do things like rely on welfare. They try to make this a response. At best for them, it is mitigation. But it's untrue that when governments get this huge influx of capital, that they are going to waste it all on the unemployment benefits of these individuals. So at best for them, even if you wanted to credit this response at its fullest, you still couldn't give them this debate. Because governments were inevitably going to have spare money to spend on things like education, things that actively improve the lives the world's most vulnerable individuals, things that meant that you could go to a hospital and you could get treated for diseases or for whatever you was ailed or whatever was ailing with you. That was why we won this debate. So incredibly proud to propose. Thank you, Speaker, for that fine speech. I'm Speaker so for four minutes and 16 seconds. Thank you all for that great debate. Um, please cross bench and shake hands virtually. Um, judges, let's go to prop prep room.